Hello and welcome to Byju's IAS, presenting to you the daily quiz for 30th of July 2021. Let us begin and have a look at the first question for today. Consider the following statements. It was designated a Ramsar wetland of international importance in 2002. Its fauna includes Indian python, king cobra, black ibis, darters. It has one of the largest populations of saltwater crocodile. The Ramsar site being talked about is Option A. Chilka Lake Option B. Bhitar Kanika Wetland Option C. Bhoj Wetland Option D. Harike Wetland What is the context? This article in the Hindu newspaper today has a mention of the Bhitar Kanika Wetland in Odisha. The Bhitar Kanika Wetland is a Ramsar site. These mangroves are one of the finest patches of mangroves along the Indian coast and it is also a wildlife sanctuary. The Bhitarkanika National Park which is famous for its mangroves is also famous for various migratory birds, the turtles, crocodiles and also many creeks. This site is known to have the highest density of saltwater crocodiles in the country. And Bhitarkanika was designated a national park in the year 1998 and a Ramsar site by UNESCO in the year 2002. So what is the fauna of this place? The park is home to saltwater crocodiles as we discussed. It has Indian pythons, black ibis, wild boar, rhesus monkey, cobra, monitor lizards, etc. Also, the olive ridley turtles nest on the Gahir Mata and other nearby beaches. Coming back to the question, all these statements point us towards our answer, which is option B, Bhitar Kanika wetland. While there are chances that you might get confused with Chilka, please remember that it was designated a Ramsar site way before Bhitar Kanika and it does not have a large population of saltwater crocodiles in India. This question highlights the importance of knowing of fauna of national parks or such Ramsar sites that are in news. A task for today is to let us know in which of these wetlands can gharials be found. Answer in the comments section. Moving on to question number 2. Which of the following can lead to crowding out effect? Overseas issue of sovereign bonds, government increasing direct public sector expenditure, government funding infrastructure development projects or government selling new bonds in the money market. What is the context? This article in the Hindu newspaper today has a mention of the crowding out as well as crowding in effect. The chief economic advisor has said that a SEBI member's comments on high government borrowings crowding out the efforts of private sector in raising funds are misplaced and are not true. He has asserted that instead the capital expenditure by government will actually help in ensuring the crowding in effect. So what is crowding out effect? It is believed that when government excessively increases its expenditure and then it finances it by borrowing, this creates many adverse effects in the economy. And the concept of crowding out indicates one such negative effects of high level of government borrowing. The crowding out effect refers to a situation where high government expenditure that is supported by high government borrowing causes a decrease in private expenditure. In simple terms, what happens under the crowding out effect is that when government increases its expenditure, private expenditure comes down. Now let us go back to the question. Can overseas issue of sovereign bonds lead to crowding out effect? Borrowing overseas to fund the fiscal deficit allows the government to raise funds in such a way that there is enough domestic credit available for private sector. So, there is no scarcity of funds to private sector because the government is borrowing from outside of the country so this has nothing to do with the funds available for the private sector, therefore this becomes incorrect. Now government increasing direct public sector expenditure. Yes, when the government increases its direct public sector expenditure, there can be a crowding out effect. For example, say the government increases its direct public sector expenditure by starting new industries. Now, this government industry pays higher wages to attract technical experts from the private sector industries. And also, this government industry increases the demand for other resources. What happens then? This raises the prices of other resources and makes private investment scheme unprofitable or more costly for the private sector. Therefore, it might end up in reducing private expenditure leading to crowding out effect. Therefore, this is correct. Now, 
Another form of crowding out can occur because the government funded infrastructure development projects can discourage private enterprises from taking up projects in the same area. This makes the project undesirable or even unprofitable for the private sector. Therefore, this can lead to crowding out effect. Government selling new bonds in the money market. When the government bonds are sold in the market to finance government expenditure, they compete with the bonds that are being sold by the private sector. And this will lead to an increase in the interest rate. Now, when the interest rates are higher, will the private sector want to borrow more? Most likely not. This is called as financial crowding out. Financial crowding out occurs when the government increases its expenditure and finances it by selling new bonds in the money market. Therefore, this statement also becomes correct, making our answer option C, 2, 3 and 4 only. Moving on to question number 3. Arrange the following tiger reserves from south to north. Parambikulam Tiger Reserve, Dudva, Panna, Pench and Bandipur. What is the context? 14 tiger reserves in India have received the accreditation of Global Conservation Assured Tiger Standards which is known as Global Cats. So what is this Global Cats? It is a conservation tool that is globally accepted for setting best practices and standards to manage tigers and assessments to benchmark progress. Now this CATS is being implemented across 125 sites in 7 tiger range countries including India. Now this accreditation has been granted to 14 reserves in India and also one each in Nepal, Bhutan and Russia. So these are the 14 tiger reserves in India that have got the CATS accreditation. Now let us locate those reserves that are there in our question. The Parambikulam Tiger Reserve is here. Then there is Bandipur. Then Pench, Panna and the Dudva Tiger Reserve. So from south to north it would be Parambikulam, Bandipur, Pench, Panna and Dudva. Therefore the right answer to this question would be option A. Moving on to question number 4. Which of the given statements with respect to Samagra Shiksha Abhyan is or are correct? It is a program for school education sector extending from preschool to class 10. It has subsumed Sarva Shiksha Abhyan, Rashtriya Madhyamik Shiksha Abhyan and Rashtriya Uchchatar Shiksha Abhyan. What is the context? This article in the PIB has a mention of the Samagra Shiksha Abhyan. So what is this Samagra Shiksha Abhyan? It is an integrated scheme for school education that was launched to improve the quality of school education. What you must remember is that this scheme treats school holistically as a continuum from preschool till the senior secondary levels. So it extends from preschool to class 12. In order to ensure an integrated and holistic school education, the Samagra Shiksha Abhyan was formed by subsuming the following three schemes. That is Rashtriya Madhyamik Shiksha Abhyan, the Sarva Shiksha Abhyan as well as the teacher's education. The main focus of this scheme is on improving the quality of education at all levels by integrating two T's which is teacher and technology. So mainly the scheme aims to support the states in implementation of the right of children to free and compulsory education which is RTE. Coming back to the question, statement number 1 becomes incorrect because this scheme extends from preschool to class 12 and not class 10. Statement 2 is also incorrect because it has subsumed Sarva Shiksha Abhyan correct, Rashtriya Madhyamik Shiksha Abhyan correct and the other scheme that it has subsumed is the teacher's education scheme. Therefore, the right answer to this question would be option D, neither 1 nor 2. Now let us take up a previous year question from prelims 2017. What is the purpose of evolved laser infrarometer space antenna that is ELISA project? to detect neutrinos, to detect gravitational waves, to detect the effectiveness of missile defense system, to study the effect of solar flares on our communication systems. The right answer to this question would be option B to detect gravitational waves. The primary objective of ELISA project was to detect and examine gravitational waves that are emitted by supermassive black holes that reside in the center of many galaxies. This project would also measure the signals of thousands of compact binary star systems in the Milky Way. A mission to test this technology, that is ELISA project's technology, was launched in the year 2015 and was known as LISA Pathfinder. 
Therefore, the right answer would be option B. Now let us take up the fact of the day for today, which is gender budgeting. Why this topic? This article in the PIB states that the Ministry of Women and Child Development has been making consistent efforts to institutionalize gender budgeting. So what is gender budgeting? Gender budgeting means preparing budgets from a gender perspective. Please pay attention, it is not a separate budget and it is not about spending equally on both genders but it is preparing the budget from a gender perspective. This is an attempt to scrutinize the budget from the gender lens and also bring out the gender differential impact. So what is this used for? So this is used as a tool for effective policy implementation. And through this, one can check if the allocations are in line with the policy commitments and also if they are having desired impacts. So what does such a budgeting do? It acknowledges the gender patterns in the society and allocates money to make policies and programs that are gender equitable. So it allows the government to promote equality through fiscal policies by setting goals or targets for equality and allocating funds to support these goals. So what does gender budgeting include? Number one, it includes the formulation of legislation or programs and schemes that are gender sensitive. Number two, it includes gender based allocation of resources to fill in this gender gap. Number three, it also includes the monitoring of expenditure and public service delivery from a gender perspective. Number four, it will also include audit and impact assessment. So this includes assessing the impact and audit of programs that are launched by the government for the benefit of women. The final step to gender budgeting would be following up or taking corrective actions so as to address these gender disparities. So these points gives a general framework of gender budgeting. So what is its importance? It ensures that the benefit of development will reach women as much as it reaches men. It also highlights that there is a need for affirmative action to address the needs of women as well. Coming to what India does in terms of gender budgeting. India adopted gender budgeting in the year 2004 and 5 and this was based on recommendations of an expert group committee that was constituted by Ministry of Finance on classification of budgetary transactions. And this was a step in tackling gender inequalities in India. As per this article, so far, 27 states and union territories have adopted gender budgeting. The Ministry of Women and Child Development has been making consistent efforts to institutionalize gender budgeting. So what are the steps that are being taken? The ministry helps in identification of a nodal department for gender budgeting and then it constitutes gender budgeting cells, then formulation of policy, creation of gender data bank, and also adding gender budget statement in the state budget. This is how gender budgeting is institutionalized at state and union territory level. That is all for today. Thank you for being with us. Keep watching and keep learning.